the title of my talk is uh, Mari Nostrum, uh, Lyric Documentation and uh, Migrant Flow uh, for Crisis. Uh, Mari Nostrum is uh, what the Romans called the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's also the name of an Italian naval, naval operation uh, to uh, rescue or to stop the flow, mainly coming from uh, Libya. Uh, so, and, and it's, it's a very interesting term uh, because um, uh, in 1911, I'll talk about this, the, the Italians declared that they had a fourth shore, which is Libya. Uh, so, so the whole idea of our sea, a fourth shore, all, all of it is, is fraught with, with um, uh, historical memory that's uh, really um, of conquest, of course. So it's also the title of, uh, I have a, a big manuscript that I'm working on, but I was honored to be invited recently by um, a press called the uh, Saraband Books from uh, Kentucky. Uh, they, uh, they, they issue um, small chapbooks, uh, and they invited me to, to, to do that. And I, I titled the little chapbook, Mari Nostro. So the name is, uh, I'm trying to own the name a little bit. So let me begin with a, with a personal story. I'll talk about documentary poetry to some extent. And then I'll talk about the challenges involved in, in maybe documenting and writing. Uh, I haven't really, um, sometimes it's almost, uh, thinking about poetry is almost like having a, a basketball player watch video of their, their dunks or something. <laughs> I don't know, it's like, wow, this is how your hand moved when you, so, so it's very difficult to, um, <laughs> to analyze that in some ways. Actually, I have a great story. There's a, there's a story about a famous forger uh, who, um, he, uh, and forger is also self-motivated by revenge against the critics who rejected them. Uh, and, uh, and so they just created this career. But this famous forger would practice what he made was were like early sketches of major works. Like if there's a famous uh, picture of the, uh, the Holy Family with uh, Mary holding the baby this way, he would do earlier versions of her holding him this way. So just to show that this was an earlier sketch of the major work. And he would practice this thing and he would create some mistake in it so that it would be recognizable that this is not an exact replica of the original. But he would do this like 150 times. He would do it and do it and do it and do it. And then when he wanted to make the final thing that he, the final forgery that he wanted to sell, he would get really drunk. Uh, and then make that final version. <laughs> so the, 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 the final version is a lot of storage learning uh, propelled, propelled by uh, uh, lack of inhib inhibition. Mm -hmm. And in essence, uh, that's what the writing process is, is uh, a lot of learning coming at a moment of uh, loss of control, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So that's what the writing, then come back, watch your video of yourself drunk and drawing your poems mm -hmm. is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, or uh, reciting your poetry is uh, maybe not that interesting. But there is a lot of history to, to tell. So here's the personal, perhaps, story. Uh, as a poet, I have a ghost poem that I've been chasing since the beginning of my writing. It is a family story and a story about colonialism with the requisite experiences of war, resistance, genocide, mass deportation, statelessness, assimilation, and return. A story that covers approximately 30 years, beginning in 1923, at the height of the Italian Reconquista of Libya, during the Mussolini's reign, and ending shortly uh, after Libyan independence, which was declared in 1951. 
The story begins as my family became refugees when the Italians reconquered Maserata, my ancestral city, in 1923, February 1923. The death of the city's leading resistance fighters and the flight of his surviving family ultimately for Egypt, a journey of about 2,000 kilometers taken on foot. Now a bit of background. In 1911, the Italians invaded Libya to colonize the country. Colonization ushered in the industrial age with its modern modes of administration, government, and systems of oppression. The Italians, uh, I think they were the first to use airplanes against, uh, in war, actually, uh, before, just before World War I. Before the Italians, Libya had been part of the Ottoman Empire for 400 years. And though that regime was also oppressive, the people had an allegiance to the caliph and to the notion of a unified Muslim entity. Unlike the Turks, the modern Italians, and I emphasize maybe modern, had little in common with the Libyans. They wanted to confiscate land and inhibit it, inhabit it with their own people. The sending of Italians off into settler colonial experiences of Libya was in essence uh, happened at the same time as, as Italians were coming in large numbers to, to the Americas. So, so we don't need to go that far, we just need to go south. There's an overpopulation, impoverished peasant population. Let's in, uh, reconquer the fourth shore and um, make that our land. Um, uh, inhabit with their own people. In 1911, my grandparents' world changed and they had to struggle to perceive new lives and new futures for themselves. Their clan was part of the resistance. One of our tribal leaders ushered in the first republic in the Arab world in 1918, the Republic of Tripoli, an experiment that failed. The Italians gathered their strength after World War I and overtook Libya, in Western Libya, with a brutal force uh, within a few months. In my ghost poem, I wanted to chronicle how my grandparents and their descendants zigzagged their lives through historical events. I was living in the U.S. at the time I wanted to write this poem. Uh, still a refugee from Libya with no access to any archival materials, there turned out to be hardly any even after I returned to Libya, as far as the Italian side of this, as far as the migration is concerned. Yet after sketching a chronology, I could not begin, I could still not begin. I was hampered by my awareness of the enormity of the, the task. There were too many gaps in the family's memory. In the, in the archives and hardly any personal stories. The poem existed as a lump in my imagination, an absence that I had, uh, that I had to proceed beyond. There was no line from my moment to the past, no arborescent existence in the sun, but a reaching out into the roots where there is only the present moment stretching deeper into the dark soil. I had wanted to make this long poem uh, as the launch, the launch of my career, but, that, but, that, but as I'd written elsewhere, several factors prevented me doing so. As a ghost presence in my own practice, it perhaps created a desire in me to write linked sequences or long poems that connect disparate elements and that take account of different epochs and perhaps of deterritorialization de and re-territorialization or the compensation, the compensatory attempts to recover the arborescent amidst the reality of one's rhizomic existence. I'm enjoying the, the Deleuze Guattari <laughs> stuff. I went on to write four books of poetry, the most recent Tocqueville published in 2010. Well, I should say a long time ago, 2010 is a long time ago, a book I consider to be my American globalization poem. A year after the release of Tocqueville, Arab revolutions began, a time of activism and hope of revisiting poetry, not much writing it, but finding in the past mirrors for the poet. In 2012, my wife, daughter, and I spent a year in Libya and began doing cultural work there that would become the bulk of my preoccupation, joy, and frustration. Wishing to return to poetry then, I thought that it is time to pursue my family's saga, perhaps as a national story that could pull the various strands of Libya's history and perhaps highlight how the nation is woven into oneness by the movements of its citizen from outside and within, that these journeys are the gossamer thread that held the nation together. 
By 2013, 2014, the tragedies of the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean became an important part of the Libya story, as well as the fact that the nation was fracturing. In the summer of 2014, my family, my small family and I left Libya for vacation, a chance to catch our breath in order to return to an ambitious agenda for our cultural work. Two weeks after we departed, civil war broke out in Tripoli, as if to complement the fighting that had begun on the eastern side of Libya in Benghazi two months prior. This would have been my second departure from Libya. I wondered when we'd be able to return. A few months later, my small immediate family and several members of our extended family rejoined in Egypt, where we spent almost two years. The culture work my wife and I had started in 2011 resumed uh, and culminated in the release of a major anthology of young Libyan writers that we published in 2000, in the summer or spring of 2017. We returned to Libya to launch the book and to help launch the careers of 25 young Libyan writers. It was a wonderful project. Two months later, however, the book was attacked by Wahhabi groups who ignited a national debate online and on television. Anyway, my co-editor, several of the young writers in the anthology, and myself became personae non grata after a Wahhabi imam issued a recorded sermon declaring that we must be crushed with an iron fist. That was nine months ago. No one talks about the book now. Several other tragedies have taken place in between. This is all to say that I am a serial refugee, despite my American passport, and maybe, and hopefully, a serial repatriate, as I'm hoping to return to Libya soon, as soon as my safety begins to seem likely, which is, of course, not to say guarantee. Images from my ghost poem project, a family saga that I wanted to tell, persist in my mind. Images of a family gathering at a time of war, thinking of how to save themselves, gathering their belongings, determining a destination, changing locations, seeking permission in between, then deciding to seek ultimate shelter in a distant place. In my family saga, my father was born somewhere along the way in 1924. The image of his birth, of my grandmother having to uh, find shelter, to leave the group, find shelter under a tree to give birth to him, has manifested itself in various ways in my imagination. It might be actually a worker. I know he was born on the road, but where and how, that is the work of my own imagination. I recall it now in my research when I read about the numerous pregnant women who've crossed the Sahara or sailed the Mediterranean in similar or perhaps more dangerous journeys. There are also numerous reminders and intersections between the personal saga and the journeys of others, that these are often spiritual journeys, not only flights. My mother, when fleeing the fighting in Benghazi in 2014, mm -hmm. insisted that she wanted to go to Egypt to visit the tomb of the saints she had known in her childhood as a young woman, not that because of the war. I recalled her devoted prayers and sense of hope and relief when I watched a group of African evangelicals praying out loud in the Moria refugee camp. It was an amazing performance. Clearly, the quest is for, greater, for something greater than bodily safety. These journeys are also to secure the future of a younger generation, reminiscent of the relatives who were carrying their children's report cards and files, going from country to country, from school to school, <coughs> to secure their children's education. <coughs> I narrate this personal background here, doubtlessly, to explain my <coughs> connection and perhaps my legitimacy as someone who wishes to write about the current experience of migration from the East and Central Mediterranean. I've witnessed this journey, or this mobility, if you will, almost all of my life. People from Sub-Saharan Africa and from other neighboring populations who are undertaking this, these perilous journeys are part of my childhood, people who came to make a living in Libya, to return home enriched, or to continue the journey elsewhere, seeking a living or more in a more stable uh, nation. I met them here in the US, and during time spent in Egypt in the 90s, and in Libya again, excuse me, again upon returning in 2011, and on and on. In my book, Amorisco, my third book, I had written about the subject seeking 
these <clears throat> brothers as sisters and fellow travelers, seeing them as brothers and sisters and fellow travelers, some embarking on boats, others heading back home packed, in packed trucks with the belongings that I acquired after years of hard work in Libya, all seeking to fulfill promises they had given to themselves and their families. But while I was motivated to write my family story in English, perhaps to humanize the people of the Arab world, I was moved this time by the dehumanization that my fellow Libyans had inflicted on the migrants as part of an ongoing cycle of violence that my compatriots are still inflicting upon themselves. The poems, and there are large numbers of refugees that are in Libya who are treated awfully in, in, in government camps. Uh, there are also these uh, private uh, holding pens, if you will, uh, where uh, uh, people are part of the trafficking business who are stay, have to pay money and are staying. I mean, essentially, it's sort of like a, a kind of extended kidnapping. Uh, but also, you have these unofficial prisons where billions are being held. There's a lot of kidnapping happening in the country itself. So it's hard to um, to think of that the migrant, to, the awful treatment of the migrants is separate from the uh, terrible uh, humanitarian or human rights condition all over the country. It's an extension. Uh, the violence is uh, Libyan versus Libyan, and it's also Libyan versus refugee. Plus, the, some of the, 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 the trafficking, the, the Libyans are kind of middlemen in many ways. They're in the middle of the position. They're not really the warlords or the, the big chiefs of the, the migration. Sometimes the, the people are, are holding uh, Nigerian travelers or Chadian or Lee from Ethiopia or Eritrea. Uh, the boss who's giving the orders is somebody from Eritrea or an Eritrean uh, trafficker who's now in Italy or who's still in Eritrea. Uh, it, so it's not a, it, the blame is to be spread, even though Libya is the most dangerous place, because it's the most dangerous place for, for everyone who gets there. The poems began to come, and I continued to seek them out of responsibility and a desire to learn through enunciation, through putting oneself in the mind of others, others who were not unlike oneself, but much less for, uh, fortunate, others who are undeniably ourselves. A poetry project like mine can fall under what has been called documentary poetry. And I'm going to give some definitions that are largely from uh, the, the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry. I'll talk a little bit about the, the types uh, of documentary poems. Uh, they all should be all familiar because of people who do uh, anthropology or field research. Uh, it's about positionality, essentially. Uh, documentary poetics is less a systematic theory or doctrine of a kind of poetry than an array of strategies and techniques that position a poem to engage in a reportage for political and ethical purposes. It is based on purportedly objective records of facts or events, but uses those record records to support, elaborate, or advance an often passionately held position. At once factual and ideological, uh, documentary poetics engages both the empirical world in which we live and the political or ethical ideals through which we navigate that world. Documentary poetics is very much influenced by documentary film. And many of the points of view or positionings take their cue from documentary film. All are based on a claim to one objective representation of actuality, insisted, insist on the, on the truth, the value, and insist on social consequences of their findings. The desire to make poetry factual, as in addressing the fact of external reality rather than inner reality, had been part of the modern, poet, modern poetry from its earliest phases. I mean, the desire to leave the, the sort of inner dialogue, the romantic poem, and to write about the larger world has been part of uh, what we call modern poetry sometime even in the 19th century. As early as the mid-1850s, American poet Walt Whitman urged artists and poets to give ultimate vivification to facts, to science, and to common lives. Modernist poets 
who invented imagism and objectivism, pushed aside scholastic logic, romantic introspection, and Victorian didacticism. They insisted, insisted that one ought to think through things. No ideas but in things, William Carlos Williams declared. Thinking is thinking, Ernest Finolosa, the Chinese scholar, uh, once declared, and he was, of course, very influential on Ezra Pound and other modernists. Consider the ways of scientists, begin by learning what has already been established, scrutinize the data, and persuade, not by force of personality, but through discovery of facts, and that's what Ezra Pound had said. Example of such imagist factual poems are uh, Pounds in the Station of the Metal, a very short poem. Um, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bar. That's his script. Uh, and then there is the great uh, first prelude of uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, Winter evening settles down, six o'clock, a lonely horse, something panned. Just uh, all these images, um, only a, a lonely horse, struts and pants. Uh, I don't have the poem in front of it, I don't remember. Stings, stings, stings and steps. Stings and steps, sorry. Thank you. So uh, uh, all of these um, uh, imagistic poems that became what poetry is, not really uh, uh, an inner search, but a deep observation of the world. Uh, since World War I, modernists and postmodernists, contemporary poets, I mean, have been writing longer hybrid forms that could include historical, civic, scientific, legislative, or journalistic information. Examples of documents used uh, have been in, in, in what's been considered documentary poetry, worker correspondences, citations of congressional hearings, medical reports, stock ticker readouts, uh, legal documents, court trial transcripts, news reports, oral history projects, field recordings, archival research. These documents uh, were, of course, sequenced, collaged, fragmented, muralized, uh, made into mosaics. Documented po uh, poetry also often works synecdochally, whereby the artist begins with a local incident narrative, we may even say uh, a case study, that becomes representative of similar other incidents and perhaps representative of the culture at large. Describing her work on the long poem, The Book of the Dead, a long multi-part poem by a mine, mine disaster in West Virginia in the 1930s, uh, Muriel Rukheiser provided a critique of capitalism through her rendition of the, an exploration of the Gully Junction disaster. The Gully, I'm calling it disaster because I don't know what else to call it, but it's essentially uh, the Gully Junction story is um, Union Carbide was uh, to build a dam through another company. And while they were, somebody was talking about the tunnels. Yes, while they were digging a tunnel for the water, they found mica. And uh, and this this is the fine uh, grain white uh, uh, material that they wanted. They decided not to mine it, it's in making it their business. But they're also under a lot of pressure to do it very quickly. And essentially, they uh, set aside all the rules, and people were died. A lot of people died. Many of them were African American migrant workers coming from from. Um, from further south, and uh, uh, you know, people were essentially they were they didn't have masks. They were, the, the machines were supposed to be uh, water. The the, 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 the drills supposed to have water on them to, to, to dampen the material. They didn't uh, care about any of that, and the the numbers of people who died uh, were perhaps a thousand people. Uh, it was a huge story, but it quickly died and. People were compensated, I think, five hundred dollars. And, you know, and, and they, 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 the settlement was this was given to a married white man. This was given to a single white man. This is given to a black white, a married man. The numbers were were uh, some monthly checks amounted to like two dollars a check. It's a terrible, terrible story. So she uh, 
wrote about it, and, and, and a lot of lyric, a lot of congressional hearings were in corporate. So it's still the, the, the sort of the premier example, achievement in many ways, of what documentary poets, the poets have done. In the Book of the Dead, the documents spoke for themselves, but Ruckheiser adds that the poems, or the, the parts of the poem, work is to extend the document through lyric, juxtaposition, commentary, and metaphor to better highlight and to lend perspective on instances of violence, hatred, suffering, and injustice. The 1950s, when the idea of objective, factual, and truthful text came under uh, withering scrutiny, uh, the B poets perhaps attempted to demystify the ideal of transparency and instead of documentarians uh, documenting or using documentation in all the arts, not just in poetry, artists turned to notions of spontaneity and authenticity as guarantors of the real. I mean, you think of the B poets being spontaneous poets and alongside them Jackson Pollock's um, uh, uh, abstract Expressionism. So you may think of Jackson Pollock's Abstract Expressionism as one of those modes where these highly rep unrepresentative works uh, presented themselves as more genuine than documentation. We can perhaps see confessionalism or confessionalist poetry in this light as well, in how it tasked the poet to become, come forth and to be the synecdoche of his or her age. You can think of Sylvia Plath as not documenting her social condition, but through voice uh, becoming a synecdoche herself of the age. By the 2000s, the tide had turned again and poets became skeptical of the romantic interiority that accompanied improvisatory composition. It also perhaps no secret then that in the 2000s, as the Bush regime embarked on several wars, that some poets began to doubt personal lyric altogether. Two leading documentary poets, Mark Nowak and Claudia Rankin, sampled journalistic, corporate, and governmental records of a media-driven, globalized economy. Resisting to unified perspectives, their poems participate in a broad culture that operates through the sharing and combining of data, often but not necessarily digitalized. This information age database poetics, like the documented poetics of the 1930s, made empirical and ethical use of archival materials. This is a great book called Look by um, Soma Sharif, who um, uses the, the sort of the uh, Pentagon's uh, terminology as source material for her. But, uh, the word look in terms of, uh, in, in, uh, in Pentagon speak is you are focusing on a target and about to, you have, a, have you had a look? Meaning have you found a target? Are you ready to explode something? So that's how language operates in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the environment scope. The flexible inventory of strategies, technology, that constitute documented poetics, however, rests on shared assumptions about the purpose of poetry, the poet's responsibility to be objective, and the imperative of ethical action in the face of social crisis and, and catastrophe. So it's, it's, uh, okay. Airplane mode. Uh, we do not have much research that has led to a typology of documentary poetry. And so film criticism is still very important as a guide. The poet uh, Jill Maggi resorts to film critic Bill Nichols' a book representing reality issues and concepts in documentary uh, to in turn give us four modes of documentary poetry. Historians, uh, anthropologists, and sociologists will find these various approaches very similar to the way they perhaps approach their work. Uh, so there's a, something called the expository mode, where essentially you have a, a poet speaker who is uh, in, in charge, uh, he's sort of the, the, the speaker, and uh, he may borrow or she may borrow, uh, but you have a certain kind of I, I, I clearly identified authorial uh, figure. It is a text that addresses the viewer directly with titles or voices, 
uh, to advance an argument about the historical world. It is the poetic equivalent of voiceover, commentary, argument, and presents knowledge outside of one's experience, hoping to educate, to describe, to portray a snapshot of a citation. Uh, in, in poetry, one of the examples, of, a recent example, was C.D. Wright's uh, book called One Big Self, where she um, uh, he documents and explores the lives of the, the long-term prisoners in Angola, <coughs> Angola prison in, in Louisiana. Um, the observational mode is a documentary, as in documentary film, the observational mode of documentary poetry is uh, non-interventional, uh, where control over the events is ceded to the speakers or to the documents. There is no uh, poet voice over, no interactive interviews or dramatized summaries of narration. Um, um, Mark Nowak has done some of that work where he combines different uh, uh, texts. He has a, a, a wonderful piece called Capitalization, and it, uh, it, it takes chapter from uh, a, a sort of a, a language, a writing primer on capitalization talks about uh, how certain uh, the treatment of um, certain company, of certain workers, and so he just combines these, he, and, and by just uh, excerpting, uh, uh, juxtaposing, uh, he renders a, a sort of a, a larger context, a theoretical as well as a particular context. Uh, another one is uh, by H.L. Hicks, where he took speeches by George W. Bush and speeches by Osama bin Laden and made poems out of both. I'm forgetting what the name of the book is. H. L. Hicks. Um, so um, the interactive mode uh, is in this mode, the poet slash filmmaker is active, present, and interacts with the interviewees. She or he is present in the film. The interactive mode, according to Nichols, has a strong present tense quality, creating a sense of the local and the specific as viewers witness a relationship, a person, a place unfold in front of them. The poem is a journey of discovery for the poet documentarian in the face of documentary and its limits sometimes the speculative takes over the... It's a... Uh, ship sailing to the Americas, an English-owned ship sailing to the Americas. And at some point, as the seas were rising during a storm, uh, it's also insured, it has in, in insurance. It was carrying slaves. Um, and ships, I think even now, are allowed, they insure their cargo, and even if they have to throw the cargo overboard to save the ship. So mm -hmm. you're saying 100 tons, you feel like your ship is going to sink, you need to lower your cargo to 70 tons, you throw the 30 overboard, and you are, that you are allowed uh, in terms of uh, sea travel. Well, this ship was carrying slaves, mm -hmm. and they felt in danger, and they threw the slaves overboard to save the ship, and came back to claim insurance. Mm -hmm. This is um, maybe 18 years later early in the 19th century. So she, uh, Phillips, documents this uh, story. It's one of the cases that uh, really sort of guided the public opinion and the political leadership in England to, to uh, bring the slave trade from England at least to England. Uh, but it is, uh, so she, she visits this story. Uh, she talks about her process. So it is the uh, details from the story. There are times where there are fictional parts, there are voices. She even tries to, to represent the process, the sound of the water, the, 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 the muffled sounds of people drowning. So it's a very wide-ranging work, but also uh, the, the reflexive part of it is uh, the, the questioning the, the author's uh, position. So um, whether they're writing in expository, observational, or interactive or reflexive modes, poets working in the documentary mode have been clearly concerned about their authority over the subject matter they are writing about, about the balance of representation 
uh, and of perspective, doing justice to the situation they are describing and making sure all its aspects are discussed. Uh, there's also the, the issue of silencing, and silencing in this uh, can happen perhaps in two ways. In a fascinating conversation regarding the issue of silence is two documentary poets, Philip Mittis, who wrote about the Iraq war, and um, Send Opera is his book, and Mark Nowak, address the idea of silencing that's perhaps inherent in documentary practices where archives and field work or oral history is used. In the process of composing documentary poetry, we are constantly forced to have to leave things out to create a frame and narrative. So there is a risk of the violence of silencing and excluding that the documentary poet attempts to address comments and interests. Mark Noack, who produced a 50-page book out of 600, 6,300 archival pages, responds in, agree in agreement. That's a lot of silences and inclusion and exclusion here, uh, he states. However, he goes on to say, the option to me seems to be the ongoing silences, silencing of those miners and mine rescue team members by the placement of the version of the story within 6,300 pages of government testimony that few beside myself would ever read. So the, the, sometimes the bulk of testimony, the bulk of information uh, where, uh, is, is what uh, silences the story. For Nowak, the enormity of the facts is a kind of silencing where the bulk makes the reading experiences and the repetition varies the uniqueness of stories. This is indeed an issue in one faces when addressing the current waves of migration to Europe and, and the resulting uh, deaths and, and uh, maltreatment. There is indeed a large number of details and a large number of people involved to the point that um, it becomes uh, overwhelming to, to enter that story. It also becomes, uh, makes it seem as if it's a known story. The details are lost in the abstraction of, uh, of um, a vague kind of simplicity. There's also the question of positionality. And I mean that to, um, uh, this was a difficult issue for me. Uh, as in many others. Uh, though I was deeply curious and emotionally invested in the migrant story, I was never able to do any systematic research on the subject. Uh, uh, approaching migrant camps in Libya was a dangerous adventure, still is. I tried several times to take part in some of the UN field trips, but I could not manage them. Uh, I could not manage to further, I was never sure what form that systematic research would take place. When I traveled to Lampedusa, the small island in Italy that used to receive the, the largest number of refugees, and Lesbos in Greece, here again, the sense of research per se had to be put aside. I stopped some young people who told me their stories, which sounded quite familiar. Two young men from Eritrea who had just arrived seemed like instant family to me. And the divide between the migrant uh, and the receiving nation. I found myself to be among the migrants, not the receiving nation. And given that a return home could be difficult, my mind fully remi reminded me of the narrow escapes and the sense of the fragility of such concepts as being a citizen and the notion of naturalization. A citizen, I am indeed, but the confrontation with immigration officers often does not feel as if one, it often feels as if one's fate is indeed in the palm of an effete, uh, where migration, you never know what the, the feeling is, what are they going to do me now? Mm -hmm. Uncertain and threatened, you are uncertain and always threatened by caprice. Mm -hmm. As a researcher, I could never position myself more than a listener if the opportunity came. The truth is that most of these refugees are tired of having to tell their stories while people are making careers out of gathering them. Some are also perhaps tired of having to be on their feet every day to revise their stories to see whatever the refugee application zeitgeist is. Um, I could not in any way position myself as a collector of data in that sense. I, look, I looked at people's faces. Uh, 
said hello, gathered bits of stories here and there, did not take any specific notes. I wanted to collect a memory of feelings, to echo a history of responses uh, deeply held within, where the impact remains, but the facts do not necessarily uh, remain facts per se. The quality of migrant speech, this is another issue. One of the reasons that made me resist the overtly documentary approach in this story was that the story of migrants has been covered repeatedly by the media. This is unlike the cases that Nowak and Rukeyser uh, had before them where the documentation was rather light or deeply buried. Even though I consider my current work on migrants to, to fall into documentary poetics, I wanted to resist documentary approaches. We will recall that there is a particular history of migrant speech within various fields of research. Australian critic Sneha Gornu, who is also a serial repatriator, notes how migrants in Australia are relegated. She writes, it is not that migrants are invisible, but their positioning is relegated to certain areas such as anthropology, sociology, oral history. In America, and we academics are at fault here, migrant literature is often raw materials for discussing social or regional global problems, but are not considered works of art at all, and hardly works of the imagination. Essentially, as Gurnu argues, migrants are hailed into being as speaking subjects, not writing subjects. Migrant speech is often made up of recorded first-person accounts, oral histories, which make migrants out to be apprentice subjects, those on the way to achieving unified subjectivity through assimilation and naturalization, perhaps. My idea is not to repeat how migrants are positioned as raw material speech, not to position them in, the language that, in, in a language that needed to be rescued like them. Positionality again. There are two philosophical statements or definitions that I found very inspiring to the writing process. One is the notion of experience. There again, Sneha Gornu uh, offers an idea. Experience is not only personal and physical, but also one's personal subjective engagement in the practices, discourses, institutions that lend significance to the events of the world. It is not just a matter of what happens to me or us, but what happens to others and how that gets to be interpreted and evaluated. Experience involves a great deal of observing and internalizing, as well as realigning personal memories with divergent experiences of others. Experience is then a tapping into our immediate capacity for empathy and opening of our channels to it and how the presence of the face of the other, as Levinas has noted, puts me in question and obliges me. But there's also what I'll call the multiple existence of the author, rather than perhaps the death of the author. The life leases offered us by the experience of writing, and I hate to say this, but also the mystery of creating a voice. Here's what Fernando Pessoa, the maker of multiple heteronyms, or the full poet personalities that he wrote under stated about his writing process. He says, I do not know who I am, what soul I have. When I speak with sincerity, I do not know what sincerity I'm speaking with. I am varyingly someone other than I of whom I do not know if he exists, if he is those others. I think what Pessoa is speaking of are moments of truth and discovery that locate themselves in us and that speak their peace using our diction, our musical attention to language, informed by our and real and imagined experiences of the world. I was glad when those knots of language, these visitations, found me the appropriate channel for their delivery. How to emphasize the written nature of migrant speech was the challenge then. The written strategies I employed in, in my poems, which I'll talk about uh, to some extent later, the written that I employed do share elements of other positionalities that can be attributed to documentary poetics. 
for example, some of the modes I've, I've written are in the expository mode, because the voice of the, the poet or a poet voice, their observational testimonial uh, testimonies made into poems. There are interactive interrogational pieces where my culpability as a poet and as a Libyan uh, is being addressed. Finally, well, there's clearly lyric texture to the poems where each is generally a voice unto its own. Together they are heteroglossal, spoken in first person, I and we, also in second person, and in third, he, she, and they. Some recurring names and speakers who appear in the poems also give the sequence hints of characters rather than just voices of a larger narrative. So there's a, a, a kind of move toward the novel. Yet, you will also note that all the poems are written in tersets, thus giving them a unified, perhaps overdetermined look as poems. And this is all to emphasize the written nature of migrant voice. And in that same regard, it was important to play with poetic forms and to allow for play or really deterritorialization and reterritorialization to take place as far as where the, uh, the poem forms are uh, concerned. Some of the poems are psalms. Some are uh, for a Libyan form called alam, which is also a similar form in Hausa called wakar baka. The alams are tiny little poems. <coughs> Actually, you probably all are familiar with the uh, uh, Veiled Sentiments, the uh, Leila yes. Abu Lover book. She's talking about these rannawat, the small poems. The poems that are exchanged, that's the alam. Uh, these are um, uh, small poems, they're not rhymed, uh, and they are exchanged and, and used as a way of, to comment on events. But they're also uh, there are events when the Alam poet comes and they're usually, actually the videos of them are usually, at least the men, they cover themselves with a sheet and they begin to, in the midst of company of other people, they begin to um, sing these poems and they move from one to they repeat one and they move from another. The, they recite some known little songs and they make up some, so it's, a, it's not an epic poet tradition it's a really compressed lyric uh, scene. So, so there are the songs, there's the alam, there's a kasida, which actually there's a form of the kasida that's written in, in Hausa, uh, sometimes even using Arabic alphabet. Uh, there's an ode, there's a ghazal, a version of the ghazal. Um, the ghazal, uh, it become a very important form. It's, it's an Urdu form that's become a very important form in, for many American poets. But it's, um, it's uh, in couplets. Uh, I and offer a version of the ghazal, but that's in tercet, if you will. There's some songs. There's a few, two curse tablets. Uh, the, the, the lead tablets is a Roman tradition, pagan tradition, where you make a lead tablet and say, may he die in next year, and throw it to the gods to fulfill your <laughs> wish. Uh, <laughs> so, some journal entries, very quick journal entries. A serenade, a calypso, which is um, a sort of a global south, and some blues. Some voicemails, funeral chants, search calls. Wow. Um, there also, there's a, a appropriation of, of Walt Whitman. I don't think I sent you that poem. There's a, a poem um, segment in Song of Myself, where Walt Whitman visits, uh, no, I sing the body electric. Uh, sing the body electric, where he visits uh, a slave market. Where he's watching the so so I, I take that moment some of the language and and discuss uh, uh, what has is basically some of the slave trade that has emerged in Libya. Uh, there are some connections with Robert Hagen's Middle Passage. Uh, it's a great poem uh, by the American poet Robert Hagen. It's not a very long poem, but he really tries to compress the Middle Passage into I don't know, maybe 200 lines. And many of his, the voices in it are uh, really of the, the traders, the ship traders, the slaves. So essentially, it's, it's a, 
It's, it's we the voice of the, the violators. But there's a collective we that sort of comes back to respond to them. There's an homage to, to Tayyip Salah. So to me, the heteroglossal uh, uh, variation, the uh, uh, a, a body and a sort of, if you will, two wings. The two wings are, are uh, um, refer to uh, occupation, uh, history of colonization, some of my, some of the, 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 the some of the experience of, of, uh, of imprisonment uh, before. I have one great, uh, I met this um, Libyan doctor, his name is Muhammad al-Mufti, and the first time I met him, he said, uh, do you know James Nguri? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about Googie Watiengo, the Kenyan writer. Did he call James Googie? I said, I know Googie Watiengo, what do you remember? He said, well, you and you know, I went to Leeds together and we did this magazine of like a post-colonial writers. So this is a person who was at the very beginnings of, uh, of, um, of the, the post-colonial literature. They were both undergraduate at Leeds. He went to be an on the medical doctor, and Ruby went back. So um, he was in prison in um, in uh, Libya. He came back to help establish a heart uh, hospital, a cardiology hospital, and Kadabush put him in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then he was in jail for like 14 years or so. Uh, one of his uh, he remembers listening to Ibsen's um, uh, An Enemy of the People on the BBC mm. and, and then a recording it on cassettes. Because in 81 the prison situation was somewhat decent in uh, uh, listening and uh, recording it in, I think on cassettes and trying to listen to it again. So uh, but then he was also trying to translate it to some of the fellow prisoners and, and so on. So what I did, and he was very impressed by, it's a very problematic speech by, uh, by Dr. Stockman, where he says, the strongest man in the world is the one who fights alone or something like that. It's a very strange passage, but a very interesting one. So, um, so I take one of the Ibsen speeches, make it into a villanelle, and then turn it into this sort of Libyan form. And it's essential. And so, so that's sort of. So it's all about this messing with its appropriation, messing with forms, uh, locating that moment of, of connection with uh, literature. So I'll read that because it's, it's a kind of a. It's not a migrant poem, but uh, it's just to give you a sense of what the, the wings are of the migrant story. Um, Alans from the Black Horse Prison, Tripoli, Libya, circa 1981. I have always loved my people and my native town, as one can love the home of his youthful days. I was not old when I left this ground. Exile, longing, memories cast a crown. A halo over the place, its people a haze. In that bright light, I stayed bound to my native town. In a hole far up north, barely alive, half drowned, where the people sleep, half starved, poor creatures, have days on rocky ground. Among them, I was a lame bird, brooding, nest bound, and what I hatched, not even fate could delay. No one can dare say, I've forgotten my native town. Now home again, I'm besieged by a thousand frowns. I see my people's illness, named their malaise, my own brothers pouring poison into the ground. I'm not their prince, an enemy now, a dangerous clown. Soon they'll try to kill me, set my house ablaze. Must I stay put? It is up to me again to consecrate this ground. The story too is that many of the people who actually do get on my bed, boats or ships or planes to Istanbul or so, are human rights activists, uh, uh, gay rights activists. There are a lot of people who are uh, uh, 
you know, uh, it's not, it's, it's a lot of uh, endangered people, really, because of their political positions. So uh, some of these are the, so, so some of that, that's one of the wing problems. Um, the, um, what you might call a, a power position poem is this one uh, set in, uh, it's in uh, at least begins with in Addis Ababa, and it has the title of a, uh, of a novel by um, Taib Saleh, the Sudanese novelist. Uh, spent years gathering eucalyptus leaves, season of migration to the north. Mm -hmm. Spent years gathering eucalyptus leaves from King Menelik's forests. Their fire makes the best injera, I'm told. You climb, wheezing, choking on Addis air, then you find yourself in these scented woods. Backbreaking, but I love bundling the leaves, how the rain soaks the scent into your clothes and skin. Maybe that's why Menelik built his palace here, a great church looming over it to show he was content. But even he was tempted away. His queen sent a messenger from the foot of Entoto, saying she's found a new Addis, flower, a baba, and he followed her like Adam out of paradise to co-found the metropolis nightmare. Was my dream worth more than enough air to live on, something between banal sin and the creator's potency, Addis to the source of the Nile, then Khartoum to Sinai, to be an asylee in Tel Aviv, or northwest through Darfur and Sebha, to the bride of the Med, names like shabby trees on a map, lines for a screen where bodies are stick figures dancing to tepid applause, each a degree in a circle inside a voice, unmarked time, days like scentless leaves, that slip through your hands. Um, uh, the, the poems uh, try to take into account some of the stories from Afghanistan and Iran, some of the Syrian stories, and also the, the Africa stories. The, 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 we were talking about this yesterday. Uh, essentially, people were going up the Red Sea to try to reach uh, Israel. There are some stories uh, recently about uh, migrants from Eritrea and Ethiopia and Sudan who are in Israel and Israel wanted to send them back to send them to um, Uganda and Rwanda I think is where they thought might be better for them. And then you had the other story which is the film discussed people uh, used to be able to go up to um, from Senegal and West Africa up to uh, through Morocco and try to get to across the Gibraltar Strait into Spain and so on. But that, when that had been, when that was closed in 2006, there was a huge uh, migration of uh, Senegal going into the Spanish uh, controlled islands in the Atlantic, such as the Canary Islands and so on. And a lot of these were fishermen. The, the seas had been uh, just depleted. The trawlers had been just taking up uh, pretty much uh, sucking the fish out of the sea and they just headed into the canal. That has been uh, shut down. So some of the people that you were in Libya became the only uh, place. People are coming from Eritrea all the way to Libya and people have been coming from Eritrea for because there's somebody always paying their their fare. They go through, they get into the trucks, the truck uh, uh, an open uh, back truck that has about 100 or maybe 150 people. They're transported into SUVs where, uh, you know, one of these um, big SUVs we see on our campus with the, the tiny undergrad in them. They have about like 30 people in these uh, cars. And then, of course, there are people who are trying to kidnap the cops. They want the cars, they're, they're, they're rogue traffickers who are. Uh, as soon as they see uh, one of these big land cruisers, they want to, and so and they they steal the cars and they dump the the people in the desert. So it's a. Uh, well, Derek Walcott has a great poem called "The Sea of History." The sea is history, and in it he's talking about how the bones of the 
people who've died in the Middle Passage uh, are a history. They are, in the same sense, the, the, the deserts uh, are a kind of history because even if you're ca crossing from west to Niger, uh, there, the chance of, of also dying is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is looming, looms over the experience. So um, let me uh, read the Calypso. And, uh, actually, let me read. Um, this is one, what you might call um, uh, kind of erasure. This is a story from Syria. And speaking of the, many of the migrants who uh, so this I just call a story. It's based on a story by a Syrian dissident Michel Kilo. Um, a story. I told the boy once there was a bird, and he said, "What is a bird?" I told the boy there was this tree, and he said, "What is a tree?" The mother was in the corner of the cell, rolled into a ball. But the boy looked on. He seemed healthy. His face was clean, his hair trimmed. That day, the guard took me out of my cell, brought me to them, and said, tell this boy a story. He used to beat me whenever I said my name. There was just a number here, he said, striking my face with a hose. Then something made him kinder. He brought me a nail clipper once every now and then an apple or some grapes. That night, we walked like thieves through the corridors. He didn't want his boss to know, and he opened their cell. So I sang the boy some songs. His young mother looked away, started to convulse, but the boy kept looking at me, not saying a word. I knocked on the bars of their door for the guard to let me out. I can't breathe, I whispered to him. She was a college student when they brought her to jail to punish her father, a dissident who fled the country. They raped her, and she had the boy there. He'd never seen the sun, kicked the ball, or felt the wind on his skin. Once out, I told the guard, I can't tell that boy anything. But you're an intellectual, he said. You must try. I could not tell if he was punishing me or trying to save the boy. <clears throat> then he too disappeared. Calypso. This is after the mighty spell. Their trawlers slurp the fish out of the seas. Their breathing wipes the clouds out of the breeze. They fuck up the world, tell you to stay home. They move their border to the edge of your town, hire your brother and cousin to keep you hemmed in. They fuck up the world, tell you you can never leave. Holes dug where used to be trees, machines policed by thugs, a Mr. Kurtz born every minute, a local with imported degrees. They fuck up the world, tell you better not come near. They send their old clothes, old cars, stale processed food, Bankers, like probation officers, chain you to the freedom to choose. They fuck up the world, always changing their slimy rules. Like termite eating up metals, grinding up animals in woods. No more ivory, but human bones, plentiful, almost free. They fuck up the world, fuck it again, until the world sees for good.
This is the Whitman. Here it's um, the word your brother is perhaps what our position is. With lines taken from Walt Whitman. The auctioneer in militia fatigues pushes you aside to conduct his business. He has 12 lined up. Of the bonds, fees, threats, and the quintillion beneficiaries, the revolving cycle of birth, poverty, and abuse, truly and steadily rolled, he knows nothing or pretends, or how they ended up in his hands, and whence they go, only his small part in the trade, and of the cunning tendons and nerves, under the glare of searchlight beams, how will they swim the pool of labor's excess? What building site or garment floor? No time to be stripped, flakes of breast muscle, pliant backbone, good-sized arms and legs, where they had been tasered, slashed, and whipped, that you may see them, nothing or pretend. But witness, you know how the living eyes met, the faces acumen stripped. Brothers, we have no time, who says, spare him talk of countless immortal lives in parlors and lecture rooms across rich republics and front tech states. He knows within their runs blood, same old blood, how easily it spills how evidence is hid and drained. Whatever the bids of the bidders, none of your brothers will exceed a hundred quid. Into the sea. This is the, uh, the tercet guzzle, perhaps. Barely out of the jerry, the boat rises with every wave, and in the back, two or three fall into the sea. At sunset, the boat starts to lose air, fills with water. Mothers and babies fall into the sea. One side stays afloat. We cling to a rope, water up to our bellies, and people fall into the sea. All night, we grip and bleed. Rain so cold, waves five stories high, if only I could fall into the sea. Sunrise, a helicopter, I find a red shirt, wave it to them. They watch us fall into the sea. They fling a small inflatable boat. I am too weak to reach it. Others try and fall into the sea. A cargo boat throws us a rope. Get us on board alive at last, but we still fall into the sea. Psalm for the Balkan Route. A peace in the palm, embers, perfumes, the scent of Abyssinia and Mecca haunt the brain. You remember weddings and feasts. Hail pop the copper dust and you open-mouthed, gazed at the world. Years have passed since that since. How does the body know how to pin so much of itself in words? Uh, another Because this is, a, this is the trafficker monologue, and, and this is one of the traffickers thinking. There are two characters that have poems earlier. They're Constance and, uh, and Blessing. And in, in Robert Hayden's uh, Middle Passage, there's a character, she's called the Guinea Rose. She is the woman that the ship captain has in his, in his cabin. So, uh, um, so in some ways there are guinea roses along this process too. There are women that are being kept by some of the kingpins of the traffic uh, and so on. And they're, they're paying 
their way this way. Traffic on my own. Don't fear their eyes. They came to you. After all, they paved their way. Or they'd kill you, given the chance. You are a key in the dicey maze of their lives. You clamp the cruelest lock. Your breath is as foul as theirs. Sometimes you think you'd had enough of this trade and death. So much life, these knots of unsorted dreaming. But the sea is calm again. Bats circle the tangerine grove, riding the sultry breeze. Time to send another boat, perhaps. What's her name? Constance or Blessing? the one paying her fare in bed. She'll be here when you return. I'll read two more. Uh, this is, Maluk is um, um, a character from a, a novel called uh, African Titanics by Abu Bakr Kahab. He is uh, an Eritrean, Eritrean writer. I actually met him in Libya in 2003. He was <coughs> uh, running the coffee shop in the Writers Union, but he was also writing short stories in Arabic. And so he would work and then he would get his stories critiqued by, by the Libyan writers who really were very supportive of him. So he, he has a, a novel that was published around. He had to. He was. A, he had. He basically enrolled among the refugees who left Libya when the war started. The, the, the revolution started in 2011, and he managed to be in Tunisia, and then he made his way to, I think, Norway uh, after becoming getting a refugee in the steps there. So he wrote this novel, and one of the characters in the novel is a poet, and his name is uh, Malouk. So, Maluk writes uh, a Qasida. The Qasida is an Arabic um, poem. It is a monorhyme, uh, meaning it's, a, it's like a, the line is about 16 syllables, but it's, the, it's one rhyme, like A, 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 A. So I, I try to uh, replicate that. So there is one rhyme that appears in the third line of, of each. Uh, uh, of each uh, stanza. Maluk's Kasida. Uh, Lampedusa, only a dozen leagues now, the bay between it and Sus, a corridor of debris, a Phoenician graveyard. Are we prepared for the storm's paradise? The starlings recite the zodiac on their wings. The Mara boots must in kindness abide. On the wireless, the noises of rescue, the double dealing of virtue and abuse, into a theater of salvation we ride. We are exalted into some hippopotamus, our mouths checked, hands gloved within human skin, their fingers inside. The mouths that speak are covered like Tuaregs, their eyes swathed with a dusky mirage, our names taken, flicker like fireflies. Loop around our wrists numbers that look like a kind of trice, the bullhorns cry, the seagulls deride. On the bridge to the slippery world, we're wrapped in gold foil, woozy, often diseased, but who is saving whom? The question is not stated, only implied. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is, I was uh, reading also stories of people in, uh, in the village of Scala Sikaninis in Greece, and there were many, many rescuers, many people who, who helped. So I wrote this song for the volunteer. And I'll end with that, because maybe it's a kind of note. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <clears throat> Psalm 41 and 2. Dear world, who am I to condemn you? Dear eyes, who am I to blind you? Dear lies, who am I to chastise you? Dear hypocrisy, who am I to claim not to know you? Dear indignance, who am I to possess you? Dear ignorance, who am I to float above you? Dear soul, who am I to shun you? Dear soul, who am I to shelter you? Dear soul, how am I to repair you? Okay. Thank you very much.